It is truly my honor to welcome everyone to this year's Names Not Numbers program. To our students, to our faculty, to parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, people who are joining us from near and far, I know that we are all in for a very, very special treat tonight with the debut of this documentary. To the Holocaust survivors whose stories you're gonna learn more about in these next few moments, we thank you. We thank you for your bravery, for your desire to share that story with the next generation. And to our students who captured those stories, we give you so much credit for taking the time, putting the care and energy into it, and ensuring that these stories will live on for many, many, many generations to come. Holocaust education is so important to the work that we do here at Golda Hawk Academy. And this program, this Names Not Numbers program that we've been part of for the last three years has only served to strengthen that for our entire community. So I wanna give a special thank you to Ms. Sternthal and Mr. Stern for their work here in school and to Ms. Tova Fish Rosenberg, the director, the creator and director of this program for bringing it to Goldock Academy and enabling us to participate. It is so vitally important that these stories be captured and be remembered. And I, once again, can't say enough how proud I am of our students for doing their part to make that happen. So with that, I thank you all again for being here tonight. Enjoy this documentary. Hi. I'm Erin Sternthal, coordinator for the Names Not Numbers program at Goldock Academy. Throughout the year, I've had the privilege of working with the students in this program and the survivors whose stories you're about to hear. The 15 students you will see in this film were committed to making sure the stories of the Holocaust live on. I want to thank our students for their dedication to this project. I know it was not easy, but each of you rose to the occasion. Your journey throughout this process is documented in the film, but it is only the beginning. I have no doubt the challenges you face in this project have helped you grow as individuals, and the impact of the stories you have heard will have a profound effect on you for years to come. Continue to share the lessons you have learned as you are the last generation to hear these accounts firsthand. To our survivors, Dr. Carl Dubovi, Miriam Gershwin, Dr. Rita Kuhn, Fran Malkin, and school great-grandparent Gladys Halpern, the words thank you don't seem strong enough to express our gratitude towards you. Your strength and determination to relive painful memories in the name of educating our students is truly admirable. And while we talk so much about heroes in today's environment, please know that each one of you defines what it means to be a hero. And we pray for your health and safety during this time. This project was made possible through the help of several people. I wanna thank journalist Alan Chernoff, Rabbi Bill Lebo, Elise Shane Brown, and Jamie Karras from the Holocaust Council, and our marketing and development team at Goldock Academy. Special thanks to Names Not Numbers advisor Mike Stern, our filmmakers Garrett Geary and Adam Chinoy, and Names Not Numbers creator Tova Fish Rosenberg. Above all else, I want to thank our donors whose generosity ensured this project would continue and whose support we are so grateful for. Thank you all for joining us to hear these five inspirational stories. Tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. The Names Not Numbers Oral History Film Documentary Project is remembering the stories of the Holocaust and is telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear, for the world to learn, and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. This unique project is in its 16th year. Over 2,500 survivors and 6,000 students have participated in it worldwide. The students were instructed by teachers and professionals. They learned interviewing techniques from journalists. They learned filming techniques and editing skills from documentary filmmakers. The students interviewed filmed and edited the two-hour interviews with each survivor to make 20-minute 
oral histories that are compiled in the Names Not Numbers documentary at the school. You're about to view the documentary Names Not Numbers, a movie in the making. This film chronicles the students as they are being trained by the professionals and includes their reflections. In it is embedded approximately 10 minutes from each interview. This is the student's work. They're filmed and edited interviews. Through this project, our students are preserving history and they are the witnesses to the witnesses. Was fear, and you went to bed with fear. You, didn't, you never knew what was going to transpire. But the Nazi that was in charge there took us to the border, gave us to the Slovak Nazis, let, let them decide what to do with this Jewish family. It was awful. To you had no idea. The goal of this documentary is to focus on the survivors and their personal experiences because each story is very different. They took out 12,000 people, mostly when they saw with children. They would always say, we have to survive, we have to bear witness. The only way you could defeat the Germans was to survive. Hi guys. I want to start by not only congratulating all of you for the efforts that you've put into this point in being here. Uh, this is an incredibly important project, one that requires a serious application process, of which all of you are clearly successful in completing. But what you have the opportunity to do here is quite unique in that you will be sitting across the table from a Holocaust survivor, from someone who has a story, a story that is going to be poignant, a story that is going to be like probably nothing you've heard before and a story that you guys have the responsibility to teach others about. It's not about the numbers, it's about the specific people that were in the Holocaust and for them to share their stories with us. If I were going to choose one of the parashot from the Torah, that describes names, not numbers, I would choose Parashat Hazinu, because in it are a few psukim that really describe this project. And one is Zohor Yumot Olam, remember the days of old. Remember is always, Zohor is always the word, word that is associated when you talk about the Holocaust. But it continues on to say how you're going to be doing that. And that's also what you're doing in names, not numbers and it is Sha'al Avicha via Gedcha. Ask your father, your forefathers, and he will tell you, and they will tell you. And that's exactly your project. You're remembering what happened in the Holocaust, but how are you doing it? By asking your questions, Sha'al Avicha. I think that it is extremely important for us to keep on getting all of the stories because it's really gonna be our way of showing the future generations that it did happen and ensuring that it's not going to happen again. Right after the war were the Nuremberg trials. These were the trials where they had caught Nazis and they put them to trial. Many of them were caught, many of them were not caught. And they fled Europe, most of them to South America, and one of them was Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann came to Argentina with his wife, changed his name, new identity, started working there, as if nothing had happened in his past. The Israelis, who had been looking for him for years, 
captured him in 60 and brought him to Israel to stay in trial for what had been done to the Jewish people during the Holocaust. So what do we need for a trial? Evidence. There was no problem with that because there were millions of pages of documents that the Germans kept. They were very proud of what they did. The uh, Greenhouse Hausner was the prosecutor and he said we also have to bring witnesses. He chose 112 survivors from all over the world who came to the trial in Jerusalem and told their stories. Most important is the world began listening to them. And that's the beginning of the survivor testimony. You are at the end of this generation that can listen to the survivor testimonies. And that's what you have in this project. This is your Zahor Yimot Olam. You're making the documentary of your survivor testimonies and you are doing it by interviewing and asking your questions, the Sha'al Avicha. Because what you're gonna notice in Dr. Moshe Avital's interview shortly is that you don't hear any questions. The students are interviewing him. But in editing, you are only putting together the answers. So the film we watched today was from Dr. Moshe Avital. Oh, for me, the most emotional part was when he talked about how when he got back with his brother and his brother did not recognize him. Uh, I connected that story because it's just being with family is a big part of my life and it was obviously a big part of um, his and it was very uh, meaningful for me to watch him reunited with his family. So from the journalist, I learned to listen. He put a lot of emphasis on listening to the survivor and really m forming a relationship with them. Uh, some of you know me. I'm Alan Chernoff, Betsy and Alana Chernoff's dad. And I'm talking to you today, not just as a parent here, but as somebody who's done a lot of interviews. I definitely wanted to remember Aunt when he told us how to phrase the questions rather than yes or no questions to say more describe can you tell me about to get more details from each event it's critical that you recognize the intense trauma that they've experienced you want to get the information there's a type of interviewing where you just you're stepping back a little bit you're giving that interview subject breathing room you're being very gentle in your approach I thought it gave me a real sense of power to be able to really decide the questions, what I really wanted to know instead of them just telling and me having to accept the information that they were sharing. So you have extremely rich material and I'm sure you're going to hear some amazing, amazing stories. Today we went to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Um, my name is uh, Paul Rodensky. I'm the Senior Director for Education here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And I am delighted to welcome you all today. To me, one of the things that really stood out was, was the diagram that they had of Auschwitz. It, I've never been to Poland. It, it really showed that all the things that we have been learning about happening, it, these people that we're gonna be talking to had to work with others to find a way to get through the horrible thing that happened to them. So they knew they were going to die, right? But they wanted that somehow their culture should at least there be a memory of their culture, right? This, is, this was Warsaw. You know, Warsaw was one of the largest Jewish cities in the world. It was 300,000 Jews in Warsaw before the war. They want to have some sort of something. They want to document what happened, okay? Um, going to the museum was a great experience, especially seeing firsthand what changed and what was different back then, and it was very interesting to see how they had to live around that. Definitely like using the camera, because it just seems like so professional. I think it's an experience that like you don't usually get. So, hi everybody. Hi. We are going to be going over filming techniques today. So, this is a camera. This is what makes movies what they are. Using the film equipment was really cool because I've always had an interest in photography and now being able to film and just give a completely different perspective than just the story 
was a really cool thing to be able to be in control of. When you're talking about you know, your shots for your survivor, you're essentially going to be wanting to shoot them pretty much head on. This is going to be a conversation between you and the subject of your film. If you put a subject too close to the edge like that and they're facing it, it's like putting them next to a wall. Make sure the way your survivor is going to be sitting. Again, pretend that there is a hashtag there and you want them to kind of more or less line up with the, the side furthest away from where they're facing. When you see someone telling their story, it's so much more powerful than just hearing it. So that's why the filmmaker really like put an emphasis on like making sure like nothing's distracting the like listener because it should be all about the survivor and all about the story. Today I'm going to meet Miriam Gershwin and I feel uh, nervous because it's the first opportunity I've really had to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a survivor. I'm going to interview Fran Malkin. I'm a little nervous for the interview, but I'm excited to hear Fran talk about her story. I'm going to be interviewing Gladys Halpern, my great-grandmother. Definitely feeling a little bit nervous, but more comfortable knowing that I know the person and that I have a relationship with her, and, but excited to hear more details about her story, even though I had heard a more general overview before from her. Today I'm going to meet Dr. Carl Dubovy, and I'm feeling very nervous as I haven't done anything like this before, but I'm also excited to be able to hear his story and what he's going to be able to share with us. I'm interviewing Dr. Rita Cohn. When I first met her when she came through the door. She had the smile on her face and I thought, wow, she's here and she's happy. Like, that's amazing. And she went through the Holocaust and she's here with her granddaughter and she's happy. She has a smile on her face. Like, that's incredible, you know? And meeting her, I thought, wow, you know, like, sh she's here, she's present and she's ready to help tell her story. That's amazing. Good afternoon, um, my name is Maya Sudri. I'm in 11th grade here, and thank you so much for participating in our Names Not Numbers program. We really appreciate it. So just to start, um, can you please tell me your name? My name is Rita Kuhn. I was born in Berlin, Germany. My father was a banker, and my mother was a housewife. She converted my father. We had a very good home, a very loving home. When Hitler came into power, we were very strong. My name is Miriam Gershwin. My maiden name was Liechtenstein. I was born the 13th of August 1923. It was in Memel, that was a German name. The Swingians took over. I called it Klaipeda. My dad was the director of a very, very large uh, company, uh, textile company. My mother stayed home. Now, one brother, uh, Mordechai, we had a housekeeper who was with us, um, and she, I think, knew more about the Jewish law with all things. Uh, the, poultry or the meat with the salt and then to wash it and all that. My name is Fran Malkin. I was born in Sokol, Poland. It's now in the Ukraine. Um, my mother and father had a confectionery store in Sokol. The Ukrainians and the Polish and the Jews were all in an interaction that wasn't the closest, but everybody got along. They, they kept their own place. My name is Gladys Halpern. I was born uh, in Rukev in 1928. My father was a businessman. He had several things. We had, uh, we had a store. My mother was home. And then she used to go down to the store to help me out. She was doing the bookkeeping, whatever she was helping out. The building was, my grandfather built the building after World War I. 
and we lived on the, what you call here, second floor, which is the middle one flight up. Uh, and all three, uh, there were three apartments on the floor. I was born in the middle one, then we lived on the one to the left, and then we moved. When the people moved out, we moved to the right, which was the largest one. And we were there till, till the Russians came in, because we were occupied by the Russians. My name is Dr. Karl Dubovi. I was born in Czechoslovakia, in a small village in, in Moravia, part of Czechoslovakia, on June 28, 1933. My mother had a small grocery store in a small village, and my father was a traveling salesman. Uh, my family consisted of my, my mom and dad, brother and sister. There was no synagogue, so it, a Jewish family would uh, take turns where we would celebrate together the holidays. We were, we were not Orthodox, but we were celebrating, you know, Sabbath and, and the holidays as much as we could. When I was five years old, my father told me who was Hitler. Things happened. My f girlfriend and I were playing on the street. We saw some two boys coming towards us. And then he said, uh, tell me, give me something of the Jew language. I said, Lut language. And he um, said, I can't tell you anything um, because all I know is prayers. He, uh, he just laughed at me and said some dirty language. So that was all. Well, I had no education at all until September 1939 when I was six years old and I was entering my first grade and this only lasted three months because from in December they told me I was the only Jewish student there. You have to go home because you're Jewish, you cannot be in school. 1930. Five, six, you know, when the German influence came in, we were not allowed anymore to go to the movies. We were not allowed to sit on benches and, you know, open benches. So um, there were always um, dogs and Jews are not allowed. I was going to school, walking to school. I saw two other, my other one of my friends there, and they said, don't come, don't come. He said, our school is burning, our temple too. And I didn't want to believe it. I knew then that how much people can be hated and hating. The Germans came also in a few days, they occupied uh, our park, you know. It was close to the German border. So they marched in March 22nd, 1939. After the Germans invaded, where did you go next? Well, then we went right away to the ghetto. It was, uh, you know, it didn't take long. But my dad worked in Kovno, and then when my uh, brother got sick, he said, look, I'm, I'm working already there in Kovno, so you come to Kovno. We we'll give up the apartment. And we got um, an apartment he got in Kovno. So the commander said to me, uh, I want to see you outside. So I came out and he said, you know, do you want to work for me? You know the English, you will be my maid. Um, what was it like getting married during wartime? Well, as I said, you know, but we had a kosher ceremony with seven times around I went, and um, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Schmuckler, 
because when after the war, when I got in touch with my grandpa, he the first thing what he wanted to know who gave the kedushim. <laughs> so when I said the Rabbi Shmukla, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Can you describe the roundup in the ghetto? Well, unfortunately, there were a lot of roundups, but the biggest one was there, but they took out twelve thousand people. Mostly when they saw with children, older people. So they went after us. So he looked at us and he said, is that one family? So my dad said, yes. And he said, straight ahead. My dad turned around and he said, and Sarah isn't here. So, so I was running where they were. And one German saw me, he said, Miriam, where are you going? I said, you, I said, you know, they took my aunt. So he went with me and we took some. I mean, look, they died later anyhow, you know. They stayed, and my brother too, they stayed in the ghetto. My, my cousin said, look, where will I go with my old mother and the two kids when they evacuated, you know, us? And my brother said, I'm not moving from here. Let them shoot me here. And I saw him that I shot him. And that, I mean, sometimes when I don't sleep and when I think, or sometimes I even dream about that. As I was there at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, the, um, an SS man came. In, in uniform, a couple of uh, SS men came and uh, told us out. We were arrested, and we didn't know what was going to happen in the in the truck. My father and my brother were here in a school playhouse. We were sitting there, and uh, we didn't know what was going to what was going to help do with us, but we expected to be transported into, into a camp. My mother wanted to follow us into the classroom there, and the SS man said, no, not you. Mm -hmm. After a while, we heard a woman's voice outside saying, give me back my children. I want to be with my children. When Germany and Russia made a pact to, to split Poland between, between themselves, we were in the Russian sector. Russian communists, the Soviet communists, took away my mother's business. They took away my uncle's business. You were not entitled to any private property under Soviet communism. So their life totally changed when the Russians came in. There was total chaos there. My uncle is Moshe Maltz. He kept a diary while we were in hiding during the war. After he died, his sons had the diary translated from Yiddish to English and published it. It's called Years of Horror, a Glimpse of Hope, the diary of a family in hiding. The Germans captured all of Sokal on June 22, 1941. On June 30th, 1941, all Jewish males between the ages of 14 and 60 were ordered to report at the open town square. Among the 400 selectees was Ellie Letzter, my sister Leah's husband. The 400 were marched off to a brick factory just outside Sokol. Their them were shot and their bodies tossed into a mass grave. That is how my sister lost her husband and my ba baby niece, Feige Hasha, which is me, Faye, Fran, her father. And so I was two years old. 
Oh, I know is my father, my mother told me that before my father went out, he came and he picked me up, he cried, he kissed me, he hugged me, he carried me and he wept. I, my first memories, I guess I was three and a half, maybe four, were, we went into a ghetto. I remember my mother sewing yellow stars. The ghetto was like several square blocks surrounded by barbed wire. There were some homes there. We all lived and moved in together. There was a railroad that ran in our ghetto. It, uh, the trains went to a death camp called Belzitz. Belzitz is not well known because nobody survived Belzitz. When you got to Belzitz, you were taken into the gas chambers. There was a lot of disease and sickness. My mother had typhus. I had typhus. I was four years old and I remember lying in the corner. And since there were no medications, you either died or you didn't. The Germans set it up in such a way to, before, to liquidate the ghettos that they had actions. So an action was they'd come into the ghetto, round up as many Jews as they could, uh, put them in the trains to Belzitz. And if you survived that action, uh, you lived until the next one. There were three in our ghetto. The third one was the final liquidation. People had set up pantries or basements or hiding places in the ghetto because everybody was trying to survive what they knew was coming. My, since my mother had a brother who worked for the railroad station, so he knew when these um, actions were coming. So my uncles would sneak out at night from the ghetto. And since they lived in that area for many years, they knew all the population. And he would go and ask people that they were friends with, Polish, if they could hide his family. And everybody said no, because to be discovered hiding Jews, you would be killed too, and your family would be killed. And then he went to Francesca Alamayava, who lived with her daughter. Her daughter was in her 20s, she worked for a post office, and she said, yeah, I'll hide your family. So there was a very prominent doctor in that town, Dr. David Kindler, and his wife and two sons came with us. She had a barn behind the house. She had pigs downstairs, and there was a ladder that led to a trap door. And we went up the trap door. There was an attic there, the shape. There was straw on the floor. There were 13 of us there. On the 1st of September, the war broke out. And the German army came in. The next morning, somebody knocked on the door, and they asked him, are they Jews here? And I'll never know whether it was malicious or just automatic, or at any rate, he says yes. They came, they took out my father, my mother, and myself. They took us out into the street, and there were people standing on both sides of the sidewalk. As they were leading us down, towards downtown, we didn't know downtown in the Jewish quarters the pogrom was going on. And a lot, of, I don't remember the numbers, but a lot of people were killed. They took us to take off the shoes, we carried the shoes like that, and we walked. At one point, the, the crowd got smaller and the people were standing on the sidewalks, the population they were watching. We were left, the three of us and the soldier. And as I said, my mother being very resourceful, always and on, on time, on point, 
So she walked over to him and she says, you take children too, pointing to me. So he says, no, take her out. So my mother said, over there is the father, take him out. So we were going, shoes in hand, to go to pass the crowd on the sidewalks. And we were playing for, you know, time was of essence because you never knew what was the next second. And my mother pushed me quick, quick, quick. And as they had to let us through, somebody spit in my face. This was my introduction to, to Hitler's occupation and what he did. He wanted contributions. So first you had to deliver uh, silver, gold, whatever you had. My father came home, he says, we have to give this. My mother had a bracelet, whatever. My mother was never for much jewelry. He took it all away. And when he came for the wedding band, my mother said no. And I still have that wedding band. You wouldn't believe it. It was November, I remember. There was another big, what they called, Axia. And they took us to the ghetto. You couldn't go in, you couldn't go out. Who was with you? My parents, my mother's sister. She lived with us because she was a pharmacist, so she worked in Zhulkiv, and my grandmother worked in Lvov, so she lived with us, and my grandfather. And everybody knew that our days were numbered. There was a list. They were invalids. You know, people didn't want to go to work. They were real invalids. And they said, all these people are going to be resettled to Belzitz. What happened in Belzitz, we know. Nobody came alive. Most of them came dead already because they were suffocated with the gas in the wagons. And when they were taken to Belzitz, which they had to make, it was a turn. So it was by Zhulkiv, train had to slow down. So they started breaking the windows, whatever, and they started to jump. And they jumped, and of course they were being shot at. A lot of them were killed, but some of them were just wounded. Whoever was wounded, they, used to, they would bring him into the ghetto and try to do the best for them. I don't know what they did. Uh, they had like a provisoric hospital, whatever. Uh, it was terrible, it was terrible. People were on the floor, people were dying like flies. And you never knew what was going to transpire. Well, when, when Hitler in, invaded the, the, the party, uh, as I said, the first thing was that I was uh, told not to go to school, so I had to be at home. In, in May of uh, 1942, the Nazi that was in charge there, uh, he gave us 24 hours, packed some luggage with you, and took us to the border, gave us to the Slovak Nazis. He also decided, let, let them decide what to do with this Jewish family. Uh, the Slovak Nazis took us to this uh, camp called Seret, which was a concentration camp similar to the one in Terezinstadt, where they collecting uh, Slovak Jews, and when they had enough of them, about 900 of them, they would make a freight train transport to Auschwitz to be killed. Uh, they made me walk around the streets and clean, be almost like a garbage garbage collector. You could say you survive. I mean, you know, I mean, if you say soup or warm water with some potatoes there, that sort of thing. I, I don't remember any meat, but I had that sort of thing. But I mean, whatever was put in front of you, whether you, you, you ate that. And the director of the camp, for some reason, he decided that he would have a wooden floor made in his office. So he got gathered the Jewish guys together, the men, and he asked them, can anybody make me a wooden floor here in the office? And the only one that raised his hand was my father. Now, my father was not a carpenter or anything like that, but they had a lumber yard when he was single. But I, I think in his mind, he said, well, let me see, maybe I could make a floor, and that would give me some advantage to be safe. The director liked the floor, and he said, I'm going to keep you. I want a shelf over here, I want a little cabinet over here. But he decided that he's going to save send the wife, my mother, and the three children this thing, to Auschwitz. And my father found out that he says, I'm going with them. And, oh, if you want me to do things for you, you keep me over here, but you have to keep my family here. And it was again a good thing for us. He decided to keep us while all the other Slovak Jews came and within a week or so were sent to Auschwitz to be killed.
where Jews were arrested. Um, and they started by saying, give us back our men, give us back our men. And uh, they kept that, doing that for a while. And more and more women came. It went on for a long, long time. I don't know how long it lasted that they were, you know, but they came, more and more people. And that was incredible. That was, in, it just was just unbelievable. Eventually, they let go. They let, the, yeah, the SS had to, had to <laughs> and, and let them, let the Jews go home again. And um, so and that was one of the, you know, one of the incredible things that people can do. These women, you know, just, and my mother. Did she ever regret converting to Judaism? Never, never, on the contrary. She was glad that she could, that she could help, and that she could be with somebody who is, well, has difficulties in life. Someone who is not, who is a wonderful person, but not recognized by some people, not being a... Oh. One day they came, that they are liquidating the ghetto, and we have to go, and they are, we, we, um, a train is waiting for us at the station. Because when they took the uh, 15 or 18 young people out of the ghetto, they said they need them for a few days to, um, to take books uh, from the library and take them another place and they have to be burned. So, so the, the father once came, he said, look, why can't you ask him when they come back and where they are? So the, the German said to him, well, then I'm sorry for her. So we knew that they are all dead. They took us to cattle cars. You couldn't sit down, you had to stand because there was so much back, you know. They didn't give us any food. There was one pail when you had to go to, you know, like to the bathroom, that was it. And they brought us to a place and they opened the doors and they said, everybody out. The men should stay, only the women with the kids. We were packed there, and um, the German people were, came out of there uh, because it probably it wasn't the first that a uh, trip came like that. So they right away said, well, we are going, you know. So we went to a um, concentration camp. It was called Stutthof. They it separated women with children on one side, other women on the other side. And they took us to barracks, and they gave us the striped uniforms, what you saw probably. Um, and there were uh, Polish capo women. They were worse than the German. There were um, uh, cuts, um, three stories high, and we were three people on one little bed. So at night, you know, when you wanted to turn, everybody had to turn. I mean, now it's a joke, at that time it wasn't. And we got a pair of shoes also. I got what probably somebody had sewn together from Schmartes, uh, like a, a, a slipper. Early in the morning, the couple came out, so we had to stay the whole day in the sun. We couldn't sit down and uh, nothing, only to stay. And she used to come back and forth whenever she felt like she, punished, you know, she hit us. Lunchtime, they brought a, cat, a big kettle with a watery soup, and that was it. Then they lined us up and they counted us and they took small, um, like 200 women. We were 500 women. 
300 women. They gave us not anymore the uniform. They gave us a dress. And they said that now you will go to work. The German policemen, you know, uh, army came and they took us. And uh, we went to a big field. And in the morning we had to go to work. And we dug ditches that if the army has to retreat, they can go underground. That was very hard work. They brought in a little pail, they said it was coffee, but it was, uh, you know, probably two beans in a, in a pail of water. So we put it in our uh, canteen and that was our breakfast. Then they also, every night, they gave um, uh, out um, a, a bread. It was heavy like stone and inside it was wet. And it was practically, let's say, like this, for three people. And that was our food for the day until we came back from uh, work. Then they had a little, they claimed it was soup, but it was also more water than soup for our dinner, and that was it. They were afraid of me because children cry. And my mother's two brothers would have this discussion between them. I don't think you should take her because she's going to cry. Why don't you put her in front of a, a church or a convent, which was very common what they did. My little four-year-old niece, Faye, that's me, uh, Leah's daughter won't stop crying. We all beg her to keep quiet. We give her toys to divert her, but nothing helps. Mrs. Halamayaba comes up to us and says, for mercy's sake, can't you people make that child stop crying? Do you want the Germans to find you and kill us all? She takes a stick and begins to beat the piglets she has bought. She hopes their squeaks of pain will drive out the sound of fake crying. We promise her that we will do something. We come to a terrible decision. We will have to kill Faith with poison from Dr. Kindler's medical bag. We can't endanger 14 other lives those of our family, the Kindlers, and the two Halamayavas because of one child. We cover Faye with blankets. Dr. Kindler pours a spoonful of poison from one of his vials and forces the spoon between Faye's lips. Faye makes a face, spits it up, and keeps on crying. After a few minutes, Faye stops crying. Her eyes fall shut. She appears unconscious. She does not seem to be breathing. My sister Leah, Faye's mother, does not weep. I forgive you for what you have done. To my child, she whispers, as long as God forgives you too. One life for a chance to save 14 other lives. Dr. Kindler leans forward to pick up the limp little body from the straw. As he touches the child, his sensitive hands feel something unexpected. He motions to me and whispers in my ear. There's a pulse. It's faint, but I can feel it. This child is alive. If the child wasn't killed by the dose of poison he gave her, it is nothing short of a miracle. Fate was meant to live. Now we spent 20 months in the hayloft. A few days later, I don't know how many, my father came because everybody knew we were going. It was just a question of when and how. Put on the coat, my mother put some money onto the collar, and you are going. So he took me to the Ukrainian police because that was the only way of getting out. And out there, in total darkness, stood somebody 
I never saw him in my life, and I don't believe my father saw him. My father said, you go, and mother will come soon after, which she did. And the man took me by the arm, and he said in Polish, of course, hold on to me and don't talk. So I held on to him, and we went in the darkness through the entire town, and we went to the train station, and we went on a train. We walked into a kitchen, whatever, and that was the first time I saw light. I don't know if she was his wife or whatever, a woman, and I still remember her eyes. I never saw such blue eyes. He said, take off your coat, so I took off my coat, and he hung it up in the kitchen, and then he pointed to the bedroom, and he said, go and go to sleep. And I'm laying there on that bed, and suddenly everything hit me. And I said, what did I do? Why did I let my father send me away? We should have all stayed together. And, and now there was no recourse. And who knows what's going to happen to me now. Can you uh, tell me about, can you describe to me Marian uh, Halitsky? Halitsky, yeah. Halitsky. He was the one who picked me up. To me, he was an old man. When I spoke to his daughter later, she said he was 56 or something like that. Had a beard and he was a um, locksmith by profession. He was very nice, yeah, he was very nice. And his daughter and his wife lived in the city because he was afraid to have us there. He was also involved with the uh, underground. So, and they used to come every week. They used to come, first of all, there was a curtain covering the wind, not at halfway, sort of. So we always made sure that we didn't walk higher, that nothing should be seen, that there's any movement or that anybody is there. And so then my mother came soon after. Then came my aunt from the ghetto in Lvov. We were seven people. If we could get a, a small loaf of bread, carefully divided it, because he had no money, we had no money. And he says he knows a woman who is crippled, and she sits in the house and she knits. So this lasted for a little while. He would bring it, we would make the things, and then there would be left of a little bit of wool. So we saved it and we would make a pair of mittens or something, and he sold that as well. But other than that, we had no income, we had nothing. We were together, thank God we, we lived in a one room together, all five of us. That, that was something that was again unusual and I think the director did it because my father, he liked my father for the work that he did for him. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate that we were treated certainly much better than the rest of the yeah. uh, Jews. So all of a sudden somebody came and said, we are free, the gates are open. So what happened, there was a Slovak uprising. Some Slovak people decided there was this feeling that the war is coming to an end and it was a president against the Slovak Nazis. And when that happened, the director and all of the guards we had, they just left and everybody says, we are ready, we are free where to go. And uh, uh, my father then decided, when, you know, having the feeling that it's, going, it's only a few months or so for the end of the war, we have to go, go and get into hiding somewhere. So he decided, to go to mountains. We found an abandoned shepherd bungalow, and that was our, I don't know, should I say home? Uh, we, we lived there until we ran out of food, and the food, why, I don't, don't ask me when my father collected salami, cheese, and bread, and water we collected from the rain that, you know, when we had a rain. And we were there from, uh, you could say, August, the end of August, the beginning of September, until November, when we ran out of food. And when we were coming from the mountains down, you needed some traveling documents to travel because now you were under Nazi occupation. But when the Nazis came inspection into our wagon, and they noticed that the documents were issued at the same time, at the same village, this thing. So, you know, they figure, you, you're J Jewish. You're they brought us back to Serre, to the same concentration camp. We left four months ago, but now it was under Nazi, concert, Nazi uh, supervision. They were sent as a labor force to Germany to work in the German uh, munition factories. 
but uh, all people, mothers and children, were put in a freight train transport to Auschwitz. So that's what we did. I and my sister, mother would have me on one side of her and my d sister on the other side, hugging us. It was really dark in that uh, freight train. The only light you had and air coming from those openings on the sides. Mm -hmm. And since there were something like 90 people in, in the wagon, it was crowded. I mean, I, don't, I think we were in the corner le leaning against the wall, that sort of thing. There were two or three people that died on the way to Auschwitz, all the people. What my mother said that we're going to die, that we're going to put, put to sleep, we will not hurt. So you didn't realize at that point that, you know, you're, when I was 11 years old, standing there and saying, well, see what happens. I think the main concern was, as long as you're not going to be painful, you're not going to have pain, everything should be okay, you'll be put just to sleep. We got to Auschwitz on December 23rd, 1944, two days before Christmas. They, we were standing there, standing there, and you could hear outside the uh, guard and the director of Auschwitz talking to each other in German, in which mother understood, discussing should we unload or should we not unload. And I understand this went on for several hours before all of a sudden the train started going in the opposite direction. And my mother was certainly related that we, she didn't know where we were going, certainly. She said it was like a postponement of our being killed. But I'm, uh, she must have said something, thank God they're not unloading us, we're going somewhere else, not knowing where, until we got to Theresienstadt when they unloaded us. And then we, we didn't even know then where we are uh, until you know, they get us there. The, you know, this was also a former army depot for the Czechoslovakian army there. And uh, we did stay, stay, they took us to one of the barracks. To Theresienstadt, uh, when we got there, they took me away from my mother right away and we were put in, it was a barrack where there were only boys and we were working 10 hours a day, again cleaning around, uh, outside. And my mother, whenever she could, she would uh, meet me on the street because she, I don't know what she was doing uh, and she would bring me a piece of bread or something like that. So that was hard time, but again, don't ask me how I survived you know, those, uh, what, five months, but we did until May that morning, uh, somebody just started yelling, screaming, we are free, we are free. The Russians came to liberate us. Well, we were bombed mm -hmm. for a long time. We, we lived in the cellar for a long time with other people, of course. The Russians were coming closer and closer, and um, we uh, waited for them and uh, didn't know what was going to happen to to us, really. But uh, we waited in the cellar for quite some time. People in the cellar said that, you know, we should go out. And we were, only the Jews went out because they knew that they wouldn't do anything to the Russians to Jews. And the classes, the streets were empty from, of people. And uh, then uh, finally we saw uh, two people, two Russians, one of them very quite young and the other one pretty, you know, all right, pretty young too. So the two people came towards us, but they wanted to know who we are, and uh, we told him, told them, and he didn't know what to do with us. Um, he didn't quite believe what we put the terror star. I mean, he thought maybe someone they would, you know, just just do that because to get something for it, and he didn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it because he didn't think that there are any more Jews at all. The, you know, they were all in the concentration camps. And all of a sudden he said, he said, okay, all right, he said, and then say the Shema. Mm -hmm. And we said the Shema. He was happy for us. 
He protected us. His name was Kasha. Kasha. And that was the beginning of a better life. They saw already that it, uh, it, 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 it's ending the war for them. So they evacuated us. So we, we marched. So they took us to the forest. They didn't say a word. When it was dark, they left us alone. They ran away. And all of a sudden, a little guy came on a white horse. He said he is a Russian Jew. In the morning he got up, he said, look, I have to go back to my uh, unit. You go here on the highway and walk until you'll see a town. They took us with Shalon, uh, with a um, transport, Narodino, home. My uh, husband and my dad were liberated in April already. So we come to Munich and they had told us where the Jewish committee is. It is in the, uh, before it was the Jewish club there. And he said, look, you can, I, we know where Nochem is, you know my husband. Uh, in the morning, I'll take you to him. He, he, and he was in the house already. I went out of the car and slowly I went up the steps, you know. And uh, when he, my, he did, I, I mean, and I didn't go till the last step. <coughs> so, but when he said, uh, look, uh, come out. So then I went up and that's how we met. Uh, June 1941. The Russians came into our town, liberated us. There was fighting ongoing in our town. I remember the shooting, the Germans were leaving, the Russians were coming in, and then my family felt it was safer to go back to our houses than this barn that might be hit by uh, bombs. So then Ms. Salamayava came up to us and said, um, I have saved the family of three Jews in my basement. We didn't know about them, and they didn't know about us the whole time, the whole 20 months. So when the war was over, there had been 6,000 Jews in our town. 30 survived, she saved 15. My mother did not know what had happened to my father. We didn't know that they were taken out to the old brick factory and shot. And at that, after the war, we found out from the local Ukrainians what had happened. We wound up eventually in Krakow, where we were in an apartment with, I don't know, with several other families. We all lived in the same apartment. I became like uh, the person who was shunned. Stay away, don't come too close to us. Don't. And it, that's like my, and I guess maybe my family still felt that I, what I had done with the crying. And maybe it was a way for them not to forgive me for, what I almost made them do. So they found that I had tuberculosis also. So we spent three years in these two DP camps. But I spent a lot of it in sanatoriums with my mother. How long were you in the house and where did you go after that? Hiding. Uh, was it 18 months? 18 months? And I was liberated on the 24th of, of August, maybe September? No, no, August, August. It's my granddaughter's birthday, we celebrate together. Yeah. So he was afraid to let us all go, that people should see, because they could kill him post factum, because he was hiding Jews. So we walked out one by one because he was afraid to let us go like that. So we 
started for Wolf. So the only way to go was to go in the, on the main road and to hold down a uh, Russian uh, army truck of not cars or, or trucks, uh, horse and wagons, big long horse and wagons. So we flagged them down, had no choice. And they left us at the bakery. I'm sure the baker knew who we were. He let us sleep on the table, which was very nice of him. He never offered a drink of water, nothing. And a truck comes by, so he took us on that truck, and in 15 minutes we were in Zhukov. We came to Clara's house, remember Clara? And my, I said, let's go in. My mother said, what, you want more headaches? And they stopped coming out from both sides. Clara's grandparents, Clara's mother, Clara. They, in this whole house, they all came out. We crossed the Danube at night in the darkness on foot to go to the part of Germany that was uh, not occupied, but it was under the American, uh, yeah, the American zone, it was called. The uh, Russian army came very quickly, much sooner than they, when the uh, guards in terrorism shall expect that. The plan was to get every, all of us to the main square and uh, kill us by machine gun. But they, they ran, thank God, ran out of, out of time that they could not do that. And so my mother and my sister came over and they said, yeah, we are free, the uh, Germans run away. And well, the question was, what are we going to do now? And I think it was not an hour or two, then somebody came in, say, I'm the Red Cross and I'm here to help you where you want to go and so on. My family might have been, if you would add everybody, was about 100 people. And out of those 100 people were the five that we survived, which is extremely, extremely rare that the whole family would su survive. And one of my uncle and his son survived. That's right. So that's seven people out of something like 98 people that were all killed. How was it like going, um, coming to the U.S. by yourself? I was on the on a ship, on a bay, ship that was actually meant for, for soldiers. Someone said, come on, come on, look at that, look at it. Just incredible, and I made it. And then, you know, I got in touch with my uh, uncle. You needed uh, working papers. And I mean, I praise uh, also Truman, uh, he helped a lot. We came to New York. And, uh, and that was it. There were newspapers, Yiddish newspapers mostly, all over the, I guess in America, Canada, Australia, where people would write looking for survivors. And when they connected, uh, they sponsored us to, in this country. We, you know, we left Austria, went to Germany, came on, the Marine Flesher came here January 17, 1949, and we lived in a neighborhood with all Holocaust survivors in Newark. We arrived in the United States in Boston. And from there, I don't know was what transport, probably trains. We came to Grand Central Station, and that's how we came to New York. Finally got an apartment. Apartment, very tiny apartment, but an apartment. By about August, my father got a letter from one of his sisters. If you are, survive, if you are living, come to America as quickly as possible. It took three years, and we came, we came by bus. It was under communism from Czechoslovakia to Sweden. And we took a Grips home. I think it's a regular ship that came, and we came to, to uh, to New York. We arrived about five, six in the evening, and apparently the immigration uh, were already closed at that point, so we had to stay on the boat till in the morning. Parents gave me private tutor to teach me because I lost all the schooling, and 
since I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to help children. I love children. And I said, well, you know, I would, would be nice to learn how to fly. So I said, get me go to Air Force. So, they, so the United States Air Force took me as a pediatrician now. It's a great uh, privilege for me to be here with all, with all of you. First of all, because uh, I know how much your Jewish studies mean to you and your Jewish experience means to you being here at, at Golda Ock Academy. I'd like to spend this time talking to you a little bit as it relates to the faith of the survivors with whom you speak, but also about your, about your own faith. That faith is sub subjective affirmation of something for which there is no proof. To speak with them, to preserve their memories, to know something about them and how they continued in life after what they experienced is a sacred responsibility. How do you, for those of you who have spoken with your survivors, uh, all of you have thought uh, about the Holocaust and all of us have been exposed to experiences where terrible things happen to good people. And how does that impact your thoughts? How your thoughts about faith, about faith in God? How do we continue to pursue faith at all when such terrible things happen? Faith is about a personal decision in something, not based always on proof, not on something we can see, but something that each of us through individual decisions come to embrace as, as our own. To me personally, this project was really impactful just because of my family history and my life growing up. Um, I grew up in Germany and I grew up in Switzerland and I saw a lot of places and a lot of things and a lot of memorials for the Holocaust and as a kid, it didn't really mean anything to me because I didn't know. And as I got older, I realized, and looking back, it, it was so insane to see a whole society just being able to continue from all of that and prosper from all that, and a whole people's just being able to continue with their lives and grow even stronger. things that I did before being becoming a PhD and all that mattered less, less to me than what I thought I should really do uh, with my life and that was to tell children my story mm -hmm. and I went to for 30 years to schools mm -hmm. children and they listened to my story. And it was just, inc just in incredible. Uh, after all that, you know, there could still be hope. If you could say something to your parents today, what would you say? I would say, um, um, I know I haven't always done the right thing that you wanted me to do, um, but I had to, you know, do something that was myself. I can't, you know, I can't live your life uh, the way you lived your life. I have to find my own life. and. Uh, Although what your life, what you did give me, helped me. And, uh, but it, it's, it's different. <laughs> yeah. Here you go, Rita. Thank you so much. Oh, presents, so look. Yeah. You got a present, Oma. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. It's a late happy birthday. It's a late birthday yeah. present over here. Oh my God. <laughs> so far, I'm lucky. I have four generations now with the little ones. Be a good Jew 
and don't to way off from that and believe and uh, don't lie and don't steal and grow up to be a match. It's for you. Oh, thank you very much. That wasn't necessary <laughs> because right I here. feel that I'm yeah. doing a mitzvah to tell you this that the future generation should remember and should, you should uh, carry it on and you should tell your children and uh, whoever wants to listen. My family, they fought so hard to survive and it knocked it out of them. My message, I think, is don't let, keep moving, don't let things defeat you. I don't know the right words of saying it. It's, I think, the most important thing we can do is support a tough, strong Israel. Because if this Israel had existed in the 1930s, I believe this Holocaust wouldn't have happened to this point. I have my uh, wife of now 40, 1971, so it would be 48 years together. So she's my everything. And my, and my two children, my life could not be any better. I'll be optimist, never give up. Never give up, no matter how bad anything gets. When I was in any uh, distress and so on, I always became, I said, listen, you, you, you cannot give up. Uh, there are good people in this world, but just be optimist. That's the main thing. And, and believe in God. I feel that God was watching us. And, and if they ever believe in miracle, you see, that this was one thing that God wanted us to be saved. Dr. Bobby, you want to give this to you? Thank you. Thank you. It was absolutely not necessary. I also say thank you very much for doing that, but there was no need for it. How does it feel to share your story today with me, your great-granddaughter, and my school? It's a big gift, and it's an achievement. I have a wonderful family, and I really mean it. We have a few special visitors for you. Yeah. Oh, hi, Brendan. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see you. When did you come in? Hi, <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah. How are you? Now you can kiss me. I'm okay already. Yeah. I'm good. Hi. <laughs> Gonna take a picture together. You want to do this program. This is an amazing program. This is a program that uh, will impact you, will impact others, and something that you will not be able to do the future. You, you will be changed as a person. Um, and that's something that you do not want to miss out on. I feel that my responsibility is, like Fran said, to make sure that the state of Israel stays important and stays prominent in the world and to make sure that as us Jews we make sure that anti-Semitism can't get out of hand and nothing like the Holocaust can happen. Uh, it really means a lot to us that they are um, willing and able to come in and share their experiences with the next uh, generation. If the survivors were here right now, I would thank them and just for being so brave to tell their story. I just, I hope that they are happy with what they've done as well.